So I've mentioned this on my channel before, but I'm always finding myself hyper fixating on various hobbies. And I found that these fixations usually have something to do with nostalgia. I'll admit it, nostalgia is like a drug to me at times. The cozy feeling of a simpler time is just impossible not to fixate on, especially as I get older. It's probably unhealthy, but I try to find some productivity in reminiscing. Like making these videos, for example, or finding appreciation and love for said thing beyond it brings me back. But maybe it brings me back is what makes it so good on a deeper level. Anyways, enough preamble, you're here for LEGO. Recently, I've been really into retro LEGO sets. LEGO is an awesome toy that promotes creativity and imagination just by existing. But more recently, LEGO's focus on detail and ingenuity with their sets has left the sets themselves feeling stiff, in my opinion. They are undoubtedly way more impressive and beautiful sometimes, but there's an even stronger beauty in the way they used to structure their sets, in my opinion, at least. So let's go way back to basically the first LEGO theme that really differentiated itself, LEGO Space. These are pretty iconic nowadays, LEGO just loves to reference these little dudes. And honestly, that's fine, because it kind of represents all the strengths with LEGO's ability to theme their sets. They have a really simple color palette with the light gray and blue, making it easy to build your own cohesive additions to the theme. And they have a clear setting and quote-unquote story, while leaving the minor details up to the imagination. Like, there are a bunch of these little dudes exploring space, they have ships and bases and tools. Go crazy. Who do they encounter? Do these guys get along? What kind of adventures do they have? Well, that's up to me. Or kid me. Okay, still current me. The sets have this openness and playful simplicity. And isn't this direction of imagination exactly what LEGO would want to promote? Like, even financially? It promotes building onto your sets. As you create stories, you'll need more ships, more things to create. Well, that's when you buy more LEGO, kid. It's kind of a win-win. It helps kids flex their imagination while making LEGO those sweet little one by 2 plate dollar bill pieces. And this was obviously very successful, and I'm just going to gush about it for a bit. I'll try to keep the themes I talk about in order of release to have a semblance of organization. Around the same time they made Classic Space, they started making Classic System Castle sets. Another perfectly vague idea, just some knights and some horses and some castles. These started introducing way more solid structures, sometimes even opening up and expanding. I just love how perfectly this theme worked within LEGO. The bricks make the iconic medieval castle roof shape. Uh, does that have a name? Or the little minifigures making perfect little knights. This iconic yellow set from 1978 is genuinely pretty impressive for the time. It feels like a real ass castle, using these slope pieces at the bottom, the hinges on the corners, and the arch pieces to create perfect windows and doorways. It really holds up, especially for 1978. And I love how much room the inside has. It feels like a perfect place to store all your minifigures and their horses once you're done. The classic castle sets basically kept up with this quality up until like the early 2000s. The 90s had some really cool variations on the theme. I love the Fright Night sets. For one, they are almost painfully nostalgic for me. I remember having a few of these and always so captivated by its ambiance. The theming is just perfect. The gray, black, and red with translucent orange accents is just so cool. I mean, look at this set, like holy moly. There's so much to it, but it's still so simple at the same time. So many little nooks and crannies. I love the aesthetics of the boxes too. These retro looking gradients are just so pleasing to the eyes. They complement the more rigid color palettes of a Lego set perfectly. And I love all the minifigures in these classic castle sets too. I still have quite a few of them, including our boy Basil the Batlord. The classic LEGO Dragon is also iconic, makes for a good companion to our boy. Ninja has to be one of my favorites too, it's kind of this subgroup of castle. I loved the ninja minifigures as a kid, and the sort of dark atmosphere these invoke is just mwah. It feels like a perfect companion piece to the castle sets. These 90s sets also introduced the absolutely iconic LEGO Skeleton. Actually, it may have not introduced him, that might have been the classic pirate sets. Speaking of, I love these pirate sets too. Once again, perfectly simple. Just some pirates in some piratey locations. 
I love these painted base plates with the little islands painted on them. And these pirate ships, holy moly, these are some of the most impressive builds of the time. It's kind of remarkable how fast LEGO fully understood the engineering and design language of their bricks. So much space for little pirates to scallywag and such. They even made Imperial Navy types to antagonize them, and possibly offensive islanders for the pirates to come across. Yay. These sets always felt like they were meant to be played with outside or like in a bathtub or something. As a kid, I loved adventure stories on ships, kind of like road trip style stories, so I would fawn over these big pirate ship sets in catalogs and magazines, thinking about all the space I could have telling these stories in my head. I also loved houses. I'm not sure how else to segue this. The last of the four Lego horsemen of quality was the legendary and kind of vague sounding town theme. So town kind of encompasses a lot of types of sets from back then, with a lot of minor themes sprinkled in. But it's basically just like real world environments and play sets. As a kid, they were probably my favorite. I think these catered to a grounded imagination, letting you play out characters and lives within a kind of generic, vague IRL set piece to tell more IRL stories, I guess, but not too vague. It's still usually a describable building or area the sets take place in. This set is a very good example of this and just kind of a really cool set in general. It has this river base plate. Oh, wait, have I even mentioned the base plates? Something LEGO rarely, if ever, does anymore, they used to make these custom painted and molded base plates that added so much room and value to a set. This one has this river going through it, and the build takes advantage of that to create this really believable mountainy scene around it. Something about the atmosphere of this set just makes me really happy. It's like it exists in this little corner of some big mountain. The little house and the car just complement the scene so well and it has so much character while being perfectly simple enough to let you do so much with it. I know some people might be like, uh, okay, Don, calm down, it's just like a house and a bridge, but that's exactly why I love these. My brain is creating a scene that's probably way more pretty and serene, but the Lego set is letting my brain do that. You know, using imagination. And speaking of aesthetics, one of my all-time favorite themes is a sub-theme of town called Paradisa. I love this theme so, so much. For one, it was a really cool way to add a bit of femininity to LEGO. Not that they weren't playable by girls, but this theme embraced the pastel colors and pinks without being too pink aisle, corporately girly, I guess. Something that LEGO would sadly lose very soon after this. And these just ooze personality and style. It may be a little much for some, but I just love how everything comes together. The pink and white with really harsh green accents of the palm trees and foliage, it's just all really, really effective. The light gray also helps solidify this very vapor wavy look, almost like they're these old Roman pillars, kinda. It's got a lot of horseback riding and big luxurious houses, a very high class vacation vibe, which I really, really like. Is it obvious that I really, really like it? It puts me in a place, this weirdly deep coated coziness and calm, a feeling I feel only works because of this simplistic look Lego has. This may seem all a little overdramatic for what essentially is LEGO Miami Vice, but I don't know, I couldn't knock this really potent happiness that these aesthetics were creating in my head. If this was a marketing strategy by LEGO, then uh, wow, that's kind of scary how deep-seated the marketing can be. And it worked, because I kind of own a few of these now. I sort of made my own mock using the Poolside Paradise set, and I like how it came out. Town is technically still a thing to this day, but it's kind of scattered across vague themes. I'll get into that in a bit. Classic Town just kind of represents LEGO at its best in my opinion, setting a stage for your creativity and letting you take over the rest, giving you complete freedom to explore that creativity. And I mean, who didn't want their own LEGO Town to play in? It was always this like pipe dream of mine. So while LEGO kind of dominated the market with these four themes, they did get a little wacky and silly and try some other things. The first one seems to have been Aquazone, an underwater theme, but definitely more fantastical than just normal submarines and fish. Lots of translucent colors, yellow juxtaposed to black, really helps sell the bright colors of undersea life. And surprise, I loved these as a kid too. The aesthetics are just top notch, like does LEGO ever fail in that department? Well, kinda. If I'm being honest, some of these designs get a little too wacky. 
Also, they start to blend together with later space sets. Like, this could easily be some alien insectoid spaceship thing. It's a balancing act, because these sets also gave us Lego sharks. So, you know, you win some, you lose some. While these are weird and neat, this theme kind of feels expected, right? An underwater exploration theme feels perfectly in line with the other major themes at the time. But the next theme ain't so typical. Time Cruisers was uh, very, very strange. But I can't help but respect and sort of love its weirdness. This is one of the first instances LEGO tried to tie a theme to kind of a bigger property. This had a comic, a German radio show thing, characters, plot, sorta. Honestly, it's in some ways just back to the future light, but it has a lot of unique ideas going on. The builds are ridiculous, but have a lot of cool function, especially for the time. And they sort of take elements from a lot of different themes at the time, giving it a kind of crossover vibe, which is fitting considering the Time Cruiser gang is traveling to all these different eras. This theme gets a lot of shit for feeling like recycled parts LEGO threw together, but honestly, if that was a necessity, what a creative way to do it. I kind of respect the theme even more knowing that. The fact that LEGO got a lot of use out of these weird pieces and builds is kind of really impressive. And while the storyline and characters are laid out for you, the scenarios and settings are very much not. This era of theming is honestly some of LEGO's best attempts at a balancing act between story and imagination, giving cohesive character and theming for kids who want that without jeopardizing the toy itself. The Time Cruisers could be going to any one of your other sets, interacting with any one of your other minifigures. It encourages you to use your imagination and bring these dudes and their monkey around the LEGO universe. Time Cruisers is neat. The builds are quirky, obviously, and I don't think it would have worked any other way. Anyways, let's talk about Johnny Thunder. The Adventurer's theme may be one of the most legendary of all LEGO's catalog. And like Time Cruisers, it's basically just another iconic 80s movie recolored. Can you guess what it's based on? Hmm. These sets rock. They are so much fun and have a lot of awesome detail and play features. The first wave of sets were all Egyptian themed spawning probably one of the most sought-after retro LEGO sets, the Temple of Anubis. And I mean, come on, look at this thing. It's so cool and has so much going on. I know I keep saying this, but I used to gawk at this in magazines and catalogs for hours. I wanted it so bad. It felt so grand and imposing. I honestly still really want it. Too bad it's like a million dollars on the aftermarket. Hooray. Adventures went on to have a few other waves revolving around different types of adventures, but I think the Egyptian one is still the best one. It just really gives a lot to work with using very little. Another hugely popular theme was Rock Raiders. I definitely missed the boat on this one. I think something about the aesthetics didn't jive with child me. That being said, I am not child me anymore, and these sets are very, very, very cool. I highly recommend checking out RR Slugger's videos about this theme. He is super thorough and just infectiously passionate about it. He's kind of the inspiration for this video and its style. Rock Raiders is a great example of a theme that has a perfect amount of story. A bunch of guys need crystals to power their ship, so they start mining on a foreign planet. You got the main cast, but that's kind of it. The theme came out in tandem with a Rock Raiders video game, which I haven't touched, but I'm told is a pretty decent little RTS. Maybe I'll play it one day, who knows. I think the colors help sell this theme for me. The vibe is a little dreary for my liking, but the teal and yellow and the old gray just look so good, and the way everything seems decently functional helps a lot with selling its setting. I know people really put this theme on a pedestal, and I can kind of see why. There are a ton of other themes I could talk about in this video. Ice Planet is very cool too, but uh, I'd be going on a long time. 90s LEGO sets are some of the most iconic and just so lovable for so many reasons, but it doesn't help that this was kind of the beginning of the end for this era of LEGO. In 1999, a certain property had a licensing agreement with LEGO that changed <laughs> a lot. Along with that, right at the turn of the millennium, LEGO dove headfirst with Bionicle, which also changed a lot. LEGO seemed dead set on making sure everything had a tie-in to some other media, and honestly, that's sort of how it's been to this day. 
There are and have been outliers. Castle did go on into the 2000s, but kind of evolved into this more Power Ranger-y story-focused theme with Knight's Kingdom. And Pirates had a one-off wave every once in a while. And don't get me wrong, there have been some super cool themes in the last decade or two with insanely inventive builds, but it's almost fundamentally a different direction and purpose than it used to be. So let's play a fun comparison game. So in 2023, LEGO has a lot of themes on store shelves, but let's subtract anything that isn't licensed by another company or broader concepts like architecture or ideas or something. So basically that leaves us with Monkey Kid, Ninjago, Speed Champions, Friends, and City. City and Friends are the closest thing we have to classic town feel, but something about them just feels off I don't know what it is, but it just has a different vibe. Maybe it's nostalgia talking because the city sets can be really fun and really cute, but I don't know. It doesn't help that what are essentially town sets are now also three-in-one creator sets and sometimes idea sets, and now you have modular buildings which basically are town on steroids, and now there are modular buildings in Marvel sets, but those modular buildings aren't compatible with city buildings? Ugh. Friends has some cool sets too. But they always feel a little half-assed in my opinion, like they're kind of half-complete. The colors are nice though, I guess. Monkey Kid and Ninjago are the closest thing we have to classic Rock Raiders adventure style sets. But unlike those old sets, these are way more focused on being attached to their properties, and that properties other forms of media. Both those themes were made with a TV show in mind, basically making them glorified license themes in a way. They probably have way more freedom to create beyond the source material compared to, like, Star Wars. Even though I feel the LEGO sets should be the source material, but whatever. I don't know, man. Something about these sets feels so different. It's not about being a vague idea anymore. It's about selling you on the characters in the show. Compare this to something like Rock Raiders. It'd be easy to expand and add to a Rock Raiders set. Follow the color scheme, use your imagination, and make something you feel would be in lore. I feel a set like this, or this, would be very hard for a kid to add to. And while you can play with that playset or toy any way you see fit, the unique aspect to LEGO was the ability to expand beyond the set or function of the set itself, create stories detached from its established lore. That's why those old sets kept things so vague. And you can do that, but I'd argue that tying a theme to a TV show immediately is kind of guiding a kid into playing with the toys in a way that fits their established brand. You must build a steak truck. Plus, look at these sets. They feel more like display pieces rather than toys. And I get that with LEGO, some buyers view them as toys, some don't, even kids. There's a balance, I feel, and I won't pretend all the Monkey Kid slash Ninjago sets fail at that. Though I do feel some of the flagship sets and their waves really don't have that balance. It's way closer to an awesome collector's piece rather than an imaginative toy, especially when considering the price of these, like geez. And am I crazy or do Ninjago and Monkey Kid kind of blend together sometimes? Like you want a mech slash weapon laced vehicle theme? Well, you're in luck, because uh, that's both of them. LEGO's focus, in terms of theming these days, is much more into designer models and licenses, of course. Sometimes combining them for really bad results. Oops. Which, don't get me wrong, is a smart direction. A lot of people who are my age, who have a strong connection to these old LEGO sets that I just gushed your ear off about, still buy LEGO sets because of this shift. If they still made sets like Time Cruisers, I don't think its seasoned audience would be buying them. These designer, hyper-detailed models is working. Working very well. And it's an impressive, classy look for LEGO. But I feel the intense, detail-oriented direction bleeds into themes like Monkey Kid and Ninjago, which I feel should be filling a similar purpose to those older, broader, imagination-forward themes. Because without them, we got kinda nothing. That element of LEGO's design philosophy that I spent so much time gushing about is more or less disappearing. Hell, besides the three-in-one sets, they don't even have alternate builds anymore. It's not even really trying to encourage kids to make something original with them. You could argue being a building system toy like LEGO inherently encourages that. But I don't know, I kind of feel when it's so tied to an established IP, show, or whatever, it doesn't. It does the opposite. But I'm sure many of you are going to start typing, what about the 90 year anniversary sets? <laughs> 
Oh, you want me to get into that too, huh? First, let me just say this. I do like modern LEGO. I'm trying to make that abundantly clear. The good modern sets are kind of beautiful and insanely impressive. Did I already say that? That was extremely evident when I built the new Galaxy Explorer set last year. This set was genius, and you could just smell the passion ruminating from it. Even as someone born probably 20 years too late to grow up with any classic space set, this set felt nostalgic. But not once did it feel as if it was being held back by that fact. It's kind of like the perfect LEGO set. Is that overzealous? I don't care. This set rocked my socks. But it's kind of the only 90 year anniversary set I like. Actually, wait, I like that creator set. It has a Paradisa reference. The others, well... The Lion Knight's Castle is really neat, but is also $500. So yeah, next. The other two were Forest Hideout and Blacktron Cruiser. Both... <sighs> gift with purchases. Okay, I'll make this quick because it's kind of off topic. The gift with purchases are exclusive timed releases that LEGO gives you if you reach a certain threshold on LEGO's website. The threshold is usually somewhere between like 100 to 200 bucks, which let's be real, isn't a lot for LEGO standards these days, but is a lot for like normal human life standards. And truthfully, the idea of gift with purchase isn't terrible, but the way it's being played out feels just so calculated and devious. You think it's a coincidence, it's timed. It doesn't have to be. You could just buy these on the shelf if they wanted you to or that they're specifically using sets that cater to a market who know the aftermarket better than any other customer. It's almost like they're trying to create some kind of fear of missing out. That'd be fun if we had like an acronym or something for that. And what a middle finger that is, targeting this towards fans that respect your legacy. I've seen people say LEGO makes super duper expensive Star Wars sets because they know they can suck Star Wars fans dry. And I can totally see that, and uh, kind of think LEGO's based for doing that. But now LEGO is sucking their own fans dry. A gift with purchase seems devious when the gift can't be bought otherwise. Just feels like a bribe with purchase. And of course, they're doing that with Bionicle soon, so like, no retro LEGO fan is safe anymore. While I don't think LEGO is trying to erase or hide their legacy per se, it does feel like their respect for their legacy is, uh, limited. I don't doubt the designers love the company's legacy. I mean, if that Galaxy Explorer set is anything to go off of, these guys are hyper nerds for this shit. But the business side, yeah, they want to move forward. But you know, nostalgia sells, so let's take advantage of that, I guess. I don't want to get too distracted to what this video is about. Retro LEGO sets are so cool, and I almost have more appreciation for it than I did when I was a kid. Everything about its design philosophy to its art direction is just so wonderful. And I'll be honest, it's been a blast to hyperfixate on it. You know, I've been trying to write a script about retro video games for months now, but I feel it always comes off so cynical every time I write something. It feels like the main talking point about that collecting market is just how horribly toxic it is. But this script has come way more naturally. While there are plenty of insane resellers of LEGO and weirdly gross profit-focused people, for the most part, it's rewarding and fun to be into. Especially when considering you can just source the pieces of old sets sometimes pretty easily on like Bricklink. It helps create a way more relaxed marketplace in my opinion. A breath of fresh air in a way. It's a subset of nostalgic childhood memories that I can confidently still have so much respect towards. Even more respect in a way. The fact that a toy could be so healthy to a child's creativity is invaluable. It's why I appreciate LEGO still being a kid's product. I'm glad parents can enjoy it with their kids now, but I don't want to lose that vital detail that made LEGO so good back in the day. The invitation to just imagine. I think most of us grew up with LEGO, right? So what's your favorite LEGO set as a kid? Or what LEGO set did you just stare at at a store for an unhealthy amount of time, just imagining all the fun you could have with it if your parents were wealthy enough to afford it as a Christmas gift? Or something of that nature, I don't know. Until next time, friends.